Preface of Christ's Object Lessons. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J. L. Baldwin. Christ's Object Lessons by Ellen G. White. Preface. Christ is the great teacher, and as a teacher he loved nature. Much of his instruction was given as he walked with his disciples by lake or river or among the hills and valleys of Palestine. In his parable teaching Christ linked divine truth with common things and incidents. Familiar objects were associated with thoughts true and beautiful, thoughts of God's loving interest in us, of the grateful homage that is his due, and of the care we should have one for another. Thus, lessons of divine wisdom and practical truth were made forcible and impressive. In the present work the parables are grouped according to their subjects and their lessons developed and illustrated. The book is by an author widely and favorably known. Like all her works, it is full of gems of truth, and to many readers it will give a new meaning to the surroundings of everyday life. The author designs that her share of the proceeds shall be devoted to educational institutions, and the publishers join heartily in this excellent work by donating the labor of manufacture. Thus, the profit that usually accrues to author and publisher will be used in educational lines. Notwithstanding this, the publishers have taken great pains to make the setting worthy of the gem, as to both the mechanical work and the illustrations. The latter are by talented New York artists, and have been designed expressly for this book. We are sure that Christ's object lessons will be appreciated by all lovers of the true and the beautiful, and that the book will make for itself a place in many hearts and homes. Publishers End of Preface Chapter 1 of Christ's Object Lessons This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Beth Thomas Christ's Object Lessons by Ellen G. White Chapter 1 Teaching in Parables In Christ's parable teaching, the same principle is seen as in his own mission to the world. That we might become acquainted with his divine character and life, Christ took our nature and dwelt among us. Divinity was revealed in humanity, the invisible glory in the visible human form. Men could learn of the unknown through the known. Heavenly things were revealed through the earthly. God was made manifest in the likeness of men. So it was in Christ's teaching. The unknown was illustrated by the known, divine truths by earthly things with which the people were most familiar. The scripture says, All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Natural things were the medium for the spiritual. The things of nature and the life experience of his hearers were connected with the truths of the written word. Leading thus from the natural to the spiritual kingdom, Christ's parables are links in the chain of truth that unites man with God and earth with heaven. In his teaching from nature, Christ was speaking of the things which his own hands had made, and which had qualities and powers that he himself had imparted. In their original perfection, all created things were an expression of the thought of God. To Adam and Eve in their Eden home, nature was full of the knowledge of God, teeming with divine instruction. Wisdom spoke to the eye, and was received into the heart, for they communed with God in his created works. As soon as the holy pair transgressed the law of the Most High, the brightness from the face of God departed from the face of nature. The earth is now marred and defiled by sin. Yet even in its blighted state, much that is beautiful remains. God's object lessons are not obliterated. Rightly understood, nature speaks of her Creator. In the days of Christ, these lessons had been lost sight of. Men had well nigh ceased to discern God in his works. The sinfulness of humanity had cast a pall over the fair face of creation, and instead of manifesting God, his works became a barrier that concealed him. Men worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator. Thus the heathen became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. So in Israel man's teaching had been put in the place of God's. Not only the things of nature, but the sacrificial service and the scriptures themselves, all given to reveal God, 
was so perverted that they became the means of concealing him. Christ sought to remove that which obscured the truth. The veil that sin has cast over the face of nature, he came to draw aside, bringing to view the spiritual glory that all things were created to reflect. His words placed the teachings of nature, as well as of the Bible, in a new aspect, and made them a new revelation. Jesus plucked the beautiful lily, and placed it in the hands of children and youth, and as they looked into his own youthful face, fresh with the sunlight of his father's countenance, he gave the lesson. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, in the simplicity of natural beauty. They toil not, neither do they spin, and yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Then followed the sweet assurance and the important lesson. Wherefore, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? In the Sermon on the Mount, these words were spoken to others besides children and youth. They were spoken to the multitude, among whom were men and women full of worries and perplexities, and sore with disappointment and sorrow. Jesus continued, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. Then spreading out his hands to the surrounding multitude, he said, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Thus Christ interpreted the message which he himself had given to the lilies and the grass of the field. He desires us to read it in every lily and every spire of grass. His words are full of assurance and tend to confirm trust in God. So wide was Christ's view of truth, so extended his teaching, that every phase of nature was employed in illustrating truth. The scenes upon which the eye daily rests were all connected with some spiritual truth, so that nature is clothed with the parables of the Master. In the earlier part of his ministry, Christ had spoken to the people in words so plain that all his hearers might have grasped truths which would make them wise unto salvation but in many hearts the truth had taken no root and it had been quickly caught away therefore speak i to them in parables he said because they seeing see not and hearing they hear not neither do they understand for this people's heart is waxed gross and their ears are dull of hearing and their eyes they have closed jesus desired to awaken inquiry he sought to arouse the careless and impress truth upon the heart Parable teaching was popular, and commanded the respect and attention not only of the Jews, but of the people of other nations. No more effective method of instruction could he have employed. If his hearers had desired a knowledge of divine things, they might have understood his words, for he was always willing to explain them to the honest inquirer. Again, Christ had truths to present which the people were unprepared to accept, or even to understand. For this reason also he taught them in parables. By connecting his teaching with the scenes of life, experience, or nature, he secured their attention and impressed their hearts. Afterward, as they looked upon the objects that illustrated his lessons, they recalled the words of the divine teacher. To minds that were open to the Holy Spirit, the significance of the Saviour's teaching unfolded more and more. Mysteries grew clear, and that which had been hard to grasp became evident. Jesus sought an avenue to every heart. By using a variety of illustrations, he not only presented truth in its different phases, but appealed to the different hearers. Their interest was aroused by figures drawn from the surroundings of their daily life. None who listened to the Saviour could feel that they were neglected or forgotten. The humblest, the most sinful heard in his teaching a voice that spoke to them in sympathy and tenderness. And he had another reason for teaching in parables. Among the multitudes that gathered about him there were priests and rabbis, scribes and elders, Herodians and rulers, world-loving, bigoted, ambitious men who desired above all things to find some accusation against him. Their spies followed his steps day after day to catch from his lips something that would cause his condemnation and forever silence the one who seemed to draw the world after him. The Saviour understood the character of these men and he presented truths in such a way that they could find nothing by which to bring his case before the Sanhedrin. In parables he rebuked the hypocrisy and wicked works of those who occupied high position, 
and in figurative language clothed truth of so cutting a character that had it been spoken in direct denunciation they would not have listened to his words and would speedily have put an end to his ministry but while he evaded the spies he made truth so clear that error was manifested and the honest in heart were profited by his lessons divine wisdom infinite grace were made plain by the things of god's creation through nature and the experiences of life men were taught of god the invisible things of him since the creation of the world were perceived through the things that are made even his everlasting power and divinity in the saviour's parable teaching is an indication of what constitutes the true higher education christ might have opened to men the deepest truths of science he might have unlocked mysteries which have required many centuries of toil and study to penetrate he might have made suggestions in scientific lines that would have afforded food for thought and stimulus for invention to the close of time but he did not do this he said nothing to gratify curiosity or to satisfy man's ambition by opening doors to worldly greatness in all his teaching christ brought the mind of man in contact with the infinite mind he did not direct the people to study men's theories about god his word or his works he taught them to behold him as manifested in his works in his word and by his providences christ did not deal in abstract theories but in that which is essential to the development of character that which will enlarge man's capacity for knowing god and increase his efficiency to do good he spoke to men of those truths that relate to the conduct of life and that take hold upon eternity it was christ who directed the education of israel concerning the commandments and ordinances of the lord he said thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates in his own teaching jesus showed how this command is to be fulfilled how the laws and principles of god's kingdom may be so presented as to reveal their beauty and preciousness when the lord was training israel to be the special representatives of himself he gave them homes among the hills and valleys in their home life and in their religious service they were brought in constant contact with nature and with the word of god so christ taught his disciples by the lake on the mountainside in the fields and groves where they could look upon the things of nature by which he illustrated his teachings and as they learned of christ they put their knowledge to use by cooperating with him in his work so through the creation we are to become acquainted with the creator the book of nature is a great lesson book which in connection with the scriptures we are to use in teaching others of his character and guiding lost sheep back to the fold of god as the works of god are studied the holy spirit flashes conviction into the mind it is not the conviction that logical reasoning produces but unless the mind has become too dark to know god the eye too dim to see him the ear too dull to hear his voice a deeper meaning is grasped and the sublime spiritual truths of the written word are impressed on the heart in these lessons direct from nature there is a simplicity and purity that makes them of the highest value all need the teaching to be derived from this source in itself the beauty of nature leads the soul away from sin and worldly attractions and towards purity peace and god too often the minds of students are occupied with men's theories and speculations falsely called science and philosophy they need to be brought into close contact with nature let them learn that creation and christianity have one god let them be taught to see the harmony of the natural with the spiritual let everything which their eyes see or their hands handle be made a lesson in character building thus the mental powers will be strengthened and character developed the whole life ennobled christ's purpose in parable teaching was in direct line with the purpose of the sabbath god gave to men the memorial of his creative power that they might discern him in the works of his hand the sabbath bids us behold in his created works the glory of the creator and it was because he desired us to do this that jesus bound up his precious lessons with the beauty of natural things on the holy rest day above all other days we should study the messages that god has written for us in nature we should study the saviour's parables where he spoke them in the fields and groves under the open sky among the grass and flowers as we come close to the heart of nature christ makes his presence real to us and speaks to our hearts of his peace and love 
and christ has linked his teaching not only with the day of rest but with the week of toil he has wisdom for him who drives the plough and sows the seed in the ploughing and sowing the tilling and reaping he teaches us to see an illustration of his work of grace in the heart so in every line of useful labour and every association of life he desires us to find a lesson of divine truth then our daily toil will no longer absorb our attention and lead us to forget god it will continually remind us of our creator and redeemer the thought of god will run like a thread of gold through all our homely cares and occupations for us the glory of his face will again rest upon the face of nature we shall ever be learning new lessons of heavenly truth and growing into the image of his purity thus we shall be taught of the lord and in the lot wherein we are called we shall abide with god end of chapter one chapter two of christ's object lessons this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by beth thomas christ's object lessons by ellen g white chapter two the sower went forth to sow by the parable of the sower christ illustrates the things of the kingdom of heaven and the work of the great husbandman for his people like a sower in the field he came to scatter the heavenly grain of truth and his parable teaching itself was the seed with which the most precious truths of his grace were sown because of its simplicity the parable of the sower has not been valued as it should be from the natural seed cast into the soil christ desires to lead our minds to the gospel seed the sowing of which results in bringing man back to his loyalty to god he who gave the parable of the tiny seed is the sovereign of heaven and the same laws that govern the earthly seed sowing govern the sowing of the seeds of truth by the sea of galilee a company had gathered to see and hear jesus an eager expectant throng the sick were there lying on their mats waiting to present their cases before him it was christ's god-given right to heal the woes of a sinful race and he now rebuked disease and diffused around him life and health and peace as the crowd continued to increase the people pressed close about christ until there was no room to receive them then speaking a word to the men in their fishing boats he stepped into the boat that was waiting to take him across the lake and bidding his disciples push off a little from the land he spoke to the multitude upon the shore beside the sea lay the beautiful plain of gennesaret beyond rose the hills and upon hillside and plain both sowers and reapers were busy the one casting seed the other harvesting the early grain looking upon the scene christ said behold the sower went forth to sow and as he sowed some seeds fell by the wayside and the birds came and devoured them some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth and when the sun was up they were scorched and because they had no root they withered away and some fell among the thorns and the thorns sprung up and choked them but others fell into good ground and brought forth fruit some a hundredfold some sixtyfold some thirtyfold christ's mission was not understood by the people of his time the manner of his coming was not in accordance with their expectations the lord jesus was the foundation of the whole jewish economy its imposing services were of divine appointment they were designed to teach people that at the time appointed one would come to whom these ceremonies pointed but the jews had exalted the forms and ceremonies and had lost sight of their object the traditions maxims and enactments of men hid from them the lessons which god intended to convey these maxims and traditions became an obstacle to their understanding and practice of true religion and when the reality came in the person of christ they did not recognize in him the fulfillment of all their types the substance of all their shadows they rejected the antitype and clung to their types and useless ceremonies the son of god had come but they continued to ask for a sign the message repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand they answered by demands for a miracle the gospel of christ was a stumbling block to them because they demanded signs instead of a saviour they expected the messiah to prove his claims by mighty deeds of conquest 
to establish his empire on the ruins of earthly kingdoms this expectation christ answered in the parable of the sower not by force of arms not by violent interpositions was the kingdom of god to prevail but by implanting of a new principle in the hearts of men he that soweth the good seed is the son of man christ had come not as a king but as a sower not for the overthrow of kingdoms but for the scattering of seed not to point his followers to earthly triumphs and national greatness but to a harvest to be gathered after patient toil and through losses and disappointments the pharisees perceived the meaning of christ's parable but to them its lesson was unwelcome they affected not to understand it to the multitude it involved in still greater mystery the purpose of the new teacher whose words had so strangely moved their hearts and so bitterly disappointed their ambitions the disciples themselves had not understood the parable but their interest was awakened they came to jesus privately and asked for an explanation this was the desire which christ wished to arouse that he might give them more definite instruction he explained the parable to them as he will make plain his word to all who seek him in sincerity of heart those who study the word of god with hearts open to the enlightenment of the holy spirit will not remain in darkness as to the meaning of the word if any man willeth to do his will christ said he shall know of the teaching whether it be of god or whether i speak from myself all who come to christ for a clearer knowledge of the truth will receive it he will unfold to them the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven and these mysteries will be understood by the heart that longs to know the truth a heavenly light will shine into the soul temple and will be revealed to others as the bright shining of a lamp on a dark path the sower went forth to sow in the east the state of affairs was so unsettled and there was so great danger from violence that the people dwelt chiefly in walled towns and the husbandmen went forth daily to their labour outside the walls so christ the heavenly sower went forth to sow he left his home of security and peace left the glory that he had with the father before the world was left his position upon the throne of the universe he went forth a suffering tempted man went forth in solitude to sow in tears to water with his blood the seed of life for a world lost his servants in like manner must go forth to sow when called to become a sower of the seed of truth abraham was bidden get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that i will show thee and he went out not knowing whither he went so to the apostle paul praying in the temple at jerusalem came the message from god depart for i will send thee far hence unto the gentiles so those who are called to unite with christ must leave all in order to follow him old associations must be broken up plans of life relinquished earthly hopes surrendered in toil and tears in solitude and through sacrifice must the seed be sown the sower soweth the word christ came to sow the world with truth ever since the fall of man satan has been sowing the seeds of error it was by a lie that he first gained control over men and thus he still works to overthrow god's kingdom in the earth and to bring men under his power a sower from a higher world christ came to sow the seeds of truth he who had stood in the councils of god who had dwelt in the innermost sanctuary of the eternal could bring to men the pure principles of truth ever since the fall of man christ had been the revealer of truth to the world by him the incorruptible seed the word of god which liveth and abideth for ever is communicated to men in that first promise spoken to our fallen race in eden christ was sowing the gospel seed but it is to his personal ministry among men and to the work which he thus established that the parable of the sower especially applies the word of god is the seed every seed has in itself a germinating principle in it the life of the plant is enfolded so there is life in god's word christ says the words that i speak unto you they are spirit and they are life he that heareth my word and believeth on him that hath sent me hath everlasting life in every command and in every promise of the word of god is the power the very life of god by which the command may be fulfilled and the promise realized he who by faith receives the word is receiving the very life and character of god 
every seed brings forth fruit after its kind sow the seed under right conditions and it will develop its own life in the plant receive into the soul by faith the incorruptible seed of the word and it will bring forth a character and a life after the similitude of the character and the life of god the teachers of israel were not sowing the seed of the word of god Christ's work as a teacher of truth was in marked contrast to that of the rabbis of his time. They dwelt upon traditions, upon human theories and speculations. Often that which man had taught and written about the word, they put in place of the word itself. Their teaching had no power to quicken the soul. The subject of Christ's teaching and preaching was the word of God. He met questioners with a plain, It is written. What saith the scriptures? How readest thou? At every opportunity, when an interest was awakened by either friend or foe, he sowed the seed of the word. He who is the way, the truth, and the life, himself the living word, points to the scriptures, saying, They are they which testify of me. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he opened to his disciples in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Christ's servants are to do the same work. In our day as of old, the vital truths of God's word are set aside for human theories and speculations. Many professed ministers of the gospel do not accept the whole Bible as the inspired word. One wise man rejects one portion, another questions another part. They set up their judgment as superior to the word. And the scripture which they do teach rests upon their own authority. Its divine authenticity is destroyed. Thus the seeds of infidelity are sown broadcast for the people become confused and know not what to believe there are many beliefs that the mind has no right to entertain in the days of christ the rabbis put a forced mystical construction upon many portions of scripture because the plain teaching of god's word condemned their practices they tried to destroy its force the same thing is done today the word of god is made to appear mysterious and obscure in order to excuse transgression of his law Christ rebuked these practices in his day. He taught that the word of God was to be understood by all. He pointed to the scriptures as of unquestionable authority, and we should do the same. The Bible is to be presented as the word of the infinite God, as the end of all controversy and the foundation of all faith. The Bible has been robbed of its power, and the results are seen in a lowering of the tone of spiritual life. In the sermons from many pulpits of today, there is not that divine manifestation which awakens the conscience and brings life to the soul. The hearers cannot say, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures? There are many who are crying out for the living God, longing for the divine presence. Philosophical theories or literary essays, however brilliant, cannot satisfy the heart the assertions and inventions of men are of no value let the word of god speak to the people let those who have heard only traditions and human theories and maxims hear the voice of him whose word can renew the soul unto everlasting life christ's favorite theme was the paternal tenderness and abundant grace of god he dwelt much upon the holiness of his character and his law he presented himself to the people as the way the truth and the life let these be the themes of christ's ministers present the truth as it is in jesus make plain the requirements of the law and the gospel tell the people of christ's life of self-denial and sacrifice of his humiliation and death of his resurrection and ascension of his intercession for them in the courts of god of his promise i will come again and receive you unto myself Instead of discussing erroneous theories, or seeking to combat the opponents of the gospel, follow the example of Christ. Let fresh truths from God's treasure house flash into life. Preach the word. Sow beside all waters. Be instant, in season and out of season. He that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? Every word of God is pure. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. The sower soweth the word. Here is presented the great principle which should underlie all educational work. The seed is the word of God. But in too many schools in our day, God's word is set aside. Other subjects occupy the mind. The study of infidel authors holds a large place in the educational system. Skeptical sentiments are interwoven in the matter placed in schoolbooks. 
scientific research becomes misleading because its discoveries are misinterpreted and perverted the word of god is compared with the supposed teachings of science and is made to appear uncertain and untrustworthy thus the seeds of doubt are planted in the minds of the youth and in time of temptation they spring up when faith in god's word is lost the soul has no guide no safeguard the youth are drawn into paths which lead away from god and from everlasting life to this cause may in great degree be attributed the widespread iniquity of our world today when the word of god is set aside its power to restrain the evil passions of the natural heart is rejected men sow to the flesh and of the flesh they reap corruption and here too is the great cause of mental weakness and inefficiency in turning from god's word to feed on the writings of uninspired men the mind becomes dwarfed and cheapened it is not brought in contact with deep broad principles of eternal truth the understanding adapts itself to the comprehension of the things with which it is familiar and in this devotion to finite things it is weakened its power is contracted and after a time it becomes unable to expand all this is false education the work of every teacher should be to fasten the mind of the youth upon the grand truths of the word of inspiration this is the education essential for this life and for the life to come and let it not be thought that this will prevent the study of the sciences or cause a lower standard in education the knowledge of god is as high as heaven and as broad as the universe there is nothing so ennobling and invigorating as a study of the great themes which concern our eternal life let the youth seek to grasp these god-given truths and their minds will expand and grow strong in the effort it will bring every student who is a doer of the word into a broader field of thought and secure for him a wealth of knowledge that is imperishable the education to be secured by searching the scriptures is an experimental knowledge of the plan of salvation such education will restore the image of god in the soul it will strengthen and fortify the mind against temptation and fit the learner to become a co-worker with christ in his mission of mercy to the world it will make him a member of the heavenly family and prepare him to share the inheritance of the saints in light but the teacher of sacred truth can impart only that which he himself knows by experience the sower sowed his seed christ taught the truth because he was the truth his own thought his character his life experience was embodied in his teaching so with his servants those who would teach the word are to make it their own by a personal experience they must know what it is to have christ made unto them wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption in presenting the word of god to others they are not to make it a suppose so or a maybe they should declare with the apostle peter we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our lord jesus christ but were eye-witnesses of his majesty every minister of christ and every teacher should be able to say with the beloved john the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the father and was manifested unto us the soil by the wayside that with which the parable of the sower chiefly deals is the effect produced on the growth of the seed by the soil into which it is cast by this parable christ was virtually saying to his hearers it is not safe for you to stand as critics of my work or to indulge disappointment because it does not meet your ideas the question of greatest importance to you is how do you treat my message upon your reception or rejection of it your eternal destiny depends explaining the seed that fell by the wayside he said when any one heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth not then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart this is he which received seed by the wayside the seed sown by the wayside represents the word of god as it falls upon the heart of an inattentive hearer like the hard beaten path trodden down by the feet of men and beasts it is the heart that becomes a highway for the world's traffic its pleasures and sins absorbed in selfish aims and sinful indulgences the soul is hardened through the deceitfulness of sin the spiritual faculties are paralyzed men hear the word but understand it not they do not discern that it applies to themselves they do not realize their need or their danger 
they do not perceive the love of christ and they pass by the message of his grace as something that does not concern them as the birds are ready to catch up the seed from the wayside so satan is ready to catch away the seeds of divine truth from the soul he fears that the word of god may awaken the careless and take effect upon the hardened heart satan and his angels are in the assemblies where the gospel is preached while angels of heaven endeavour to impress hearts with the word of god the enemy is on the alert to make the word of no effect with an earnestness equalled only by his malice he tries to thwart the work of the spirit of god while christ is drawing the soul by his love satan tries to turn away the attention of the one who is moved to seek the saviour he engages the mind with worldly schemes he excites criticism or insinuates doubt and unbelief the speaker's choice of language or his manner may not please the hearers and they dwell upon these defects thus the truth they need and which god has graciously sent them makes no lasting impression satan has many helpers many who profess to be christians are aiding the tempter to catch away the seeds of truth from other hearts many who listen to the preaching of the word of god make it the subject of criticism at home they sit in judgment on the sermon as they would on the words of a lecturer or a political speaker the message that should be regarded as the word of the lord to them is dwelt upon with trifling or sarcastic comment the minister's character motives and actions and the conduct of fellow members of the church are freely discussed severe judgment is pronounced gossip or slander repeated and this in the hearing of the unconverted often these things are spoken by parents in the hearing of their own children thus are destroyed respect for god's messengers and reverence for their message and many are taught to regard lightly god's word itself thus in the homes of professed christians many youth are educated to be infidels and the parents question why their children are so little interested in the gospel and so ready to doubt the truth of the bible they wonder that it is so difficult to reach them with moral and religious influences they do not see that their own example has hardened the hearts of their children the good seed finds no place to take root and satan catches it away in stony places he that received the seed into stony places the same is he that heareth the word and anon with joy receiveth it yet hath he not root in himself but dureth for a while for when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word by and by he is offended the seed sown upon stony ground finds little depth of soil the plant springs up quickly but the root cannot penetrate the rock to find nutriment to sustain its growth and it soon perishes many who make a profession of religion are stony ground hearers like the rock underlying the layer of earth the selfishness of the natural heart underlies the soil of their good desires and aspirations the love of self is not subdued they have not seen the exceeding sinfulness of sin and the heart has not been humbled under a sense of its guilt this class may be easily convinced and appear to be bright converts but they have only a superficial religion it is not because men receive the word immediately nor because they rejoice in it that they fall away as soon as matthew heard the saviour's call immediately he rose up left all and followed him as soon as the divine word comes to our hearts god desires us to receive it and it is right to accept it with joy joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth and there is joy in the soul that believes on christ but those who in the parable are said to receive the word immediately do not count the cost they do not consider what the word of god requires of them they do not bring it face to face with all their habits of life and yield themselves fully to its control the roots of the plant strike down deep into the soil and hidden from sight nourish the life of the plant so with the christian it is by the invisible union of the soul with christ through faith that the spiritual life is nourished but the stony ground hearers depend upon self instead of christ they trust in their good works and good impulses and are strong in their own righteousness they are not strong in the lord and in the power of his might such a one hath not root in himself for he is not connected with christ the hot summer sun that strengthens and ripens the hardy grain destroys that which has no depth of root so he who hath not root in himself dureth for a while but when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word by and by he is offended 
many received the gospel as a way of escape from suffering rather than as a deliverance from sin they rejoice for a season for they think that religion will free them from difficulty and trial while life moves smoothly with them they may appear to be consistent christians but they faint beneath the fiery test of temptation they cannot bear reproach for christ's sake when the word of god points out some cherished sin or requires self-denial or sacrifice they are offended it would cost them too much effort to make a radical change in their life they look at the present inconvenience and trial and forget the eternal realities like the disciples who left jesus they are ready to say this is a hard saying who can hear it there are very many who claim to serve god but who have no experimental knowledge of him their desire to do his will is based upon their own inclination not upon the deep conviction of the holy spirit their conduct is not brought into harmony with the law of god they profess to accept christ as their saviour but they do not believe that he will give them power to overcome their sins they have not a personal relation with the living saviour and their characters reveal defects both hereditary and cultivated it is one thing to assent in a general way to the agency of the holy spirit and another thing to accept his work as a reprover calling to repentance many feel a sense of estrangement from god a realization of their bondage to self and sin they make efforts for reform but they do not crucify self they do not give themselves entirely into the hands of christ seeking for divine power to do his will they are not willing to be moulded after the divine similitude in a general way they acknowledge their imperfections but they do not give up their particular sins with each wrong act the old selfish nature is gaining strength the only hope for these souls is to realize in themselves the truth of christ's words to nicodemus ye must be born again except a man be born from above he cannot see the kingdom of god true holiness is wholeness in the service of god this is the condition of true christian living christ asks for an unreserved consecration for undivided service he demands the heart the mind the soul the strength self is not to be cherished he who lives to himself is not a christian love must be the principle of action love is the underlying principle of god's government in heaven and earth and it must be the foundation of the christian's character this alone can make and keep him steadfast this alone can enable him to withstand trial and temptation and love will be revealed in sacrifice the plan of redemption was laid in sacrifice a sacrifice so broad and deep and high that it is immeasurable christ gave all for us and those who receive christ will be ready to sacrifice all for the sake of their redeemer the thought of his honor and glory will come before anything else if we love jesus we shall love to live for him to present our thank offerings to him to labor for him the very labor will be light for his sake we shall covet pain and toil and sacrifice we shall sympathize with his longing for the salvation of men we shall feel the same tender craving for souls that he has felt this is the religion of christ anything short of it is a deception no mere theory of truth or profession of discipleship will save any soul we do not belong to christ unless we are his wholly it is by half-heartedness in the christian life that men become feeble in purpose and changeable in desire the effort to serve both self and christ makes one a stony ground hearer and he will not endure when the test comes upon him among thorns he also that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful the gospel seed often falls among thorns and noxious weeds and if there is not a moral transformation in the human heart if old habits and practices and the former life of sin are not left behind if the attributes of satan are not expelled from the soul the wheat crop will be choked the thorns will come to be the crop and will kill out the wheat grace can thrive only in the heart that is being constantly prepared for the precious seeds of truth the thorns of sin will grow in any soil they need no cultivation but grace must be carefully cultivated the briars and thorns are always ready to spring up and the work of purification must advance continually 
if the heart is not kept under the control of god if the holy spirit does not work unceasingly to refine and ennoble the character the old habits will reveal themselves in the life men may profess to believe the gospel but unless they are sanctified by the gospel their profession is of no avail if they do not gain the victory over sin then sin is gaining the victory over them the thorns that have been cut off but not uprooted grow apace until the soul is overspread with them christ specified the things that are dangerous to the soul as recorded by mark he mentions the cares of this world the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things luke specifies the cares riches and pleasures of this life these are what choke the word the growing spiritual seed the soul ceases to draw nourishment from christ and spirituality dies out of the heart the cares of this world no class is free from temptation to worldly care to the poor toil and deprivation and the fear of want bring perplexities and burdens to the rich come fear of loss and a multitude of anxious cares many of christ's followers forget the lesson he has bidden us learn from the flowers of the field they do not trust to his constant care christ cannot carry their burden because they do not cast it upon him therefore the cares of life which should drive them to the saviour for help and comfort separate them from him many who might be fruitful in god's service become bent on acquiring wealth their whole energy is absorbed in business enterprises and they feel obliged to neglect things of a spiritual nature thus they separate themselves from god we are enjoined in the scriptures to be not slothful in business we are to labor that we may impart to him who needs christians must work they must engage in business but they can do this without committing sin but many become so absorbed in business that they have no time for prayer no time for the study of the bible no time to seek and serve god at times the longings of the soul go out for holiness and heaven but there is no time to turn aside from the din of the world to listen to the majestic and authoritative utterances of the spirit of god the things of eternity are made subordinate the things of the world supreme it is impossible for the seed of the word to bring forth fruit for the life of the soul is given to nourish the thorns of worldliness and many who are working with a very different purpose fall into like error they are working for others good their duties are pressing their responsibilities are many and they allow their labor to crowd out devotion communion with god through prayer and a study of his word is neglected they forget what christ has said without me ye can do nothing they walk apart from christ their life is not pervaded by his grace and the characteristics of self are revealed their service is marred by desire for supremacy and the harsh unlovely traits of the unsubdued heart here is one of the chief secrets of failure in christian work this is why its results are often so meagre the deceitfulness of riches the love of riches has an infatuating deceptive power too often those who possess worldly treasure forget that it is god who gives them power to get wealth they say my power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth their riches instead of awakening gratitude to god lead to the exaltation of self they lose the sense of their dependence upon god and their obligation to their fellow men instead of regarding wealth as a talent to be employed for the glory of god and the uplifting of humanity they look upon it as a means of serving themselves instead of developing in man the attributes of god riches thus used are developing in him the attributes of satan the seed of the word is choked with thorns and pleasures of this life there is danger in amusement that is sought merely for self-gratification all habits of indulgence that weaken the physical powers that becloud the mind or that benumb the spiritual perceptions are fleshly lusts which war against the soul and the lusts of other things these are not necessarily things sinful in themselves but something that is made first instead of the kingdom of god whatever attracts the mind from god whatever draws the affections away from christ is an enemy to the soul when the mind is youthful and vigorous and susceptible of rapid development there is great temptation to be ambitious for self to serve self if worldly schemes are successful there is an inclination to continue in a line that deadens conscience and prevents a correct estimate as to what constitutes real excellence of character 
when circumstances favor this development growth will be seen in a direction prohibited by the word of god in this formative period of their children's life the responsibility of parents is very great it should be their study to surround the youth with right influences influences that will give them correct views of life and its true success instead of this how many parents make it their first object to secure for their children worldly prosperity all their associations are chosen with reference to this object many parents make their home in some large city and introduce their children into fashionable society they surround them with influences that encourage worldliness and pride in this atmosphere the mind and soul are dwarfed the high and noble aims of life are lost sight of the privilege of being sons of god heirs of eternity is bartered for worldly gain many parents seek to promote the happiness of their children by gratifying their love of amusement they allow them to engage in sports and to attend parties of pleasure and provide them with money to use freely in display and self-gratification the more the desire for pleasure is indulged the stronger it becomes the interest of these youth is more and more absorbed in amusement until they come to look upon it as the great object of life they form habits of idleness and self-indulgence that make it almost impossible for them ever to become steadfast christians even the church which should be the pillar and ground of the truth is found encouraging the selfish love of pleasure when money is to be raised for religious purposes to what means do many churches resort to bazaars suppers fancy fairs even to lotteries and like devices often the place set apart for god's worship is desecrated by feasting and drinking buying selling and merrymaking respect for the house of god and reverence for his worship are lessened in the minds of the youth the barriers of self-restraint are weakened selfishness appetite the love of display are appealed to and they strengthen as they are indulged the pursuit of pleasure and amusement centers in the cities many parents who choose a city home for their children thinking to give them greater advantages meet with disappointment and too late repent of their terrible mistake the cities of today are fast becoming like sodom and gomorrah the many holidays encourage idleness the exciting sports theatre-going horse-racing gambling liquor-drinking and reveling stimulate every passion to intense activity the youth are swept away by the popular current those who learn to love amusement for its own sake open the door to a flood of temptations they give themselves up to social gaiety and thoughtless mirth and their intercourse with pleasure lovers has an intoxicating effect upon the mind they are led on from one form of dissipation to another until they lose both the desire and the capacity for a life of usefulness their religious aspirations are chilled their spiritual life is darkened all the nobler faculties of the soul all that link man with the spiritual world are debased it is true that some may see their folly and repent and god may pardon them but they have wounded their own souls and brought upon themselves a lifelong peril the power of discernment which ought ever to be kept keen and sensitive to distinguish between right and wrong is in a great measure destroyed they are not quick to recognize the guiding voice of the holy spirit or to discern the devices of satan too often in time of danger they fall under temptation and are led away from god the end of their pleasure-loving life is ruin for this world and for the world to come cares riches pleasures all are used by satan in playing the game of life for the human soul the warning is given love not the world neither the things that are in the world if any man love the world the love of the father is not in him for all that is in the world the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the father but is of the world he who reads the hearts of men as an open book says take heed to yourselves lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life and the apostle paul by the holy spirit writes they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition for the love of money is the root of all evil which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows preparation of the soil throughout the parable of the sower christ represents the different results of the sowing as depending upon the soil in every case the sower and the seed are the same 
thus he teaches that if the word of god fails of accomplishing its work in our hearts and lives the reason is to be found in ourselves but the result is not beyond our control true we cannot change ourselves but the power of choice is ours and it rests with us to determine what we will become the wayside the stony ground the thorny ground hearers need not remain such the spirit of god is ever seeking to break the spell of infatuation that holds men absorbed in worldly things and to awaken a desire for the imperishable treasure it is by resisting the spirit that men become inattentive to or neglectful of god's word they are themselves responsible for the hardness of heart that prevents the good seed from taking root and for the evil growths that check its development the garden of the heart must be cultivated the soil must be broken up by deep repentance for sin poisonous satanic plants must be uprooted the soil once overgrown by thorns can be reclaimed only by diligent labor so the evil tendencies of the heart can be overcome only by earnest effort in the name and strength of jesus the lord bids us by his prophet break up your fallow ground and sow not among thorns sow to yourselves in righteousness reap in mercy this work he desires to accomplish for us and he asks us to cooperate with him the sowers of the seed have a work to do in preparing hearts to receive the gospel in the ministry of the word there is too much sermonizing and too little a real heart-to-heart -heart work there is need of personal labor for the souls of the lost in christ-like sympathy we should come close to men individually and seek to awaken their interest in the great things of eternal life their hearts may be as hard as the beaten highway and apparently it may be a useless effort to present the saviour to them but while logic may fail to move and argument be powerless to convince the love of christ revealed in personal ministry may soften the stony heart so that the seed of truth can take root so the sowers have something to do that the seed may not be choked with thorns or perish because of shallowness of soil at the very outset of the christian life every believer should be taught its foundation principles he should be taught that he is not merely to be saved by christ's sacrifice but that he is to make the life of christ his life and the character of christ his character let all be taught that they are to bear burdens and to deny natural inclination let them learn the blessedness of working for christ following him in self-denial and enduring hardness as good soldiers let them learn to trust his love and to cast on him their cares let them taste the joy of winning souls for him in their love and interest for the lost they will lose sight of self the pleasures of the world will lose their power to attract and its burdens to dishearten the ploughshare of truth will do its work it will break up the fallow ground it will not merely cut off the tops of the thorns but it will take them out by the roots in good ground the sower is not always to meet with disappointment of the seed that fell into good ground the saviour said this is he that heareth the word and understandeth it which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some an hundredfold some sixty some thirty that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart having heard the word keep it and bring forth fruit with patience the honest and good heart of which the parable speaks is not a heart without sin for the gospel is to be preached to the lost christ said i came not to call the righteous but sinners to repentance he has an honest heart who yields to the conviction of the holy spirit he confesses his guilt and feels his need of the mercy and love of god he has a sincere desire to know the truth that he may obey it the good heart is a believing heart one that has faith in the word of god without faith it is impossible to receive the word he that cometh to god must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him this is he that heareth the word and understandeth it the pharisees of christ's day closed their eyes lest they should see and their ears lest they should hear therefore the truth could not reach their hearts they were to suffer retribution for their wilful ignorance and self-imposed blindness but christ taught his disciples that they were to open their minds to instruction and be ready to believe he pronounced a blessing upon them because they saw and heard with eyes and ears that believed 
the good ground hearer receives the word not as the word of men but as it is in truth the word of god only he who receives the scriptures as the voice of god speaking to himself is a true learner he trembles at the word for to him it is a living reality he opens his understanding and his heart to receive it such hearers were cornelius and his friends who said to the apostle peter now therefore are we all here present before god to hear all the things that are commanded thee of god a knowledge of the truth depends not so much upon strength of intellect as upon pureness of purpose the simplicity of an earnest dependent faith to those who in humility of heart seek for divine guidance angels of god draw near the holy spirit is given to open to them the rich treasures of the truth the good ground hearers having heard the word keep it satan with all his agencies of evil is not able to catch it away merely to hear or to read the word is not enough he who desires to be profited by the scriptures must meditate upon the truth that has been presented to him by earnest attention and prayerful thought he must learn the meaning of the words of truth and drink deep of the spirit of holy oracles god bids us fill the mind with great thoughts pure thoughts he desires us to meditate upon his love and mercy to study his wonderful work in the great plan of redemption then clearer and still clearer will be our perception of truth higher holier our desire for purity of heart and clearness of thought the soul dwelling in the pure atmosphere of holy thought will be transformed by communion with god through the study of the scriptures and bring forth fruit those who having heard the word keep it will bring forth fruit in obedience the word of god received into the soul will be manifest in good works its results will be seen in a christ-like character and life christ said of himself I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. And the scripture says, He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. The word of God often comes in collision with man's hereditary and cultivated traits of character and his habits of life but the good ground hearer in receiving the word accepts its conditions and requirements his habits customs and practices are brought into submission to god's word in his view the commands of finite erring man sink into insignificance beside the word of the infinite god with the whole heart with undivided purpose he is seeking the life eternal and at the cost of loss persecution or death itself he will obey the truth and he brings forth fruit with patience none who receive god's word are exempt from difficulty and trial but when affliction comes the true christian does not become restless distrustful or despondent though we cannot see the definite outcome of affairs or discern the purpose of god's providences we are not to cast away our confidence remembering the tender mercies of the lord we should cast our care upon him and with patience wait for his salvation through conflict the spiritual life is strengthened trials well borne will develop steadfastness of character and precious spiritual graces the perfect fruit of faith meekness and love often matures best amid storm clouds and darkness the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and latter rain so the christian is to wait with patience for the fruition in his life of the word of god often when we pray for the graces of the spirit god works to answer our prayers by placing us in circumstances to develop these fruits but we do not understand his purpose and wonder and are dismayed yet none can develop these graces except through the process of growth and fruit bearing our part is to receive god's word and to hold it fast yielding ourselves fully to its control and its purpose in us will be accomplished if a man love me christ said he will keep my words and my father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him the spell of a stronger a perfect mind will be over us for we have a living connection with the source of all enduring strength in our divine life we shall be brought into captivity to jesus christ we shall no longer live the common life of selfishness but christ will live in us his character will be reproduced in our nature thus shall we bring forth the fruits of the holy spirit 
some thirty, some sixty, and some a hundred. End of chapter two. Chapter three of Christ's Object Lessons. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ashling. Christ's Object Lessons by Ellen G. White. Chapter 3. First the Blade, then the Ear. The parable of the sower excited much questioning. Some of the hearers gathered from it that Christ was not to establish an earthly kingdom, and many were curious and perplexed. Seeing their perplexity, Christ used other illustrations, still seeking to turn their thoughts from the hope of a worldly kingdom to the work of God's grace in the soul. And he said, So is the kingdom of God, as if a man should cast seed into the ground, and should sleep, and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up, he knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear but when the fruit is brought forth immediately he putteth in the sickle because the harvest is come the husbandman who putteth in the sickle because the harvest is come can be no other than christ it is he who at the last great day will reap the harvest of the earth but the sower of the seed represents those who labor in christ's stead the seed is said to spring and grow up, he knoweth not how, and this is not true of the Son of God. Christ does not sleep over his charge, but watches it day and night. He is not ignorant of how the seed grows. The parable of the seed reveals that God is at work in nature. The seed has in itself a germinating principle, a principle that God himself has implanted, Yet if left to itself, the seed would have no power to spring up. Man has his part to act in promoting the growth of the grain. He must prepare and enrich the soil and cast in the seed. He must till the fields, but there is a point beyond which he can accomplish nothing. No strength or wisdom of man can bring forth the seed of the living plant. Let man put forth his efforts to the utmost limit. He must still depend upon one who has connected the sowing and the reaping by wonderful links of his own omnipotent power. There is life in the seed, there is power in the soil, but unless an infinite power is exercised day and night, the seed will yield no returns. The showers of rain must be sent to give moisture to the thirsty fields, the sun must impart heat, electricity must be conveyed to the buried seed. The life which the Creator has implanted, He alone can call forth. Every seed grows, every plant develops by the power of God. As the earth bringeth forth her bud, and as the garden causeth the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth. As in the natural, so in the spiritual sowing. The teacher of truth must seek to prepare the soil of the heart. He must sow the seed, but the power that alone can produce life is from God. There is a point beyond which human effort is in vain. While we are to preach the word, we cannot impart the power that will quicken the soul and cause righteousness and praise to spring forth. In the preaching of the word there must be the working of an agency beyond any human power. Only through the Divine Spirit will the Word be living and powerful to renew the soul unto eternal life. This is what Christ tried to impress upon his disciples. He taught that it was nothing they possessed in themselves which would give success to their labors, but that it is the miracle-working power of God which gives efficiency to his own Word. The work of the sower is a work of faith. The mystery of the germination and growth of the seed he cannot understand, but he has confidence in the agencies by which God causes vegetation to flourish. In casting his seed into the ground, he is apparently throwing away the precious grain that might furnish bread for his family, but he is only giving up a present good for a larger return. 
He cast the seed away, expecting to gather it many fold in an abundant harvest. So Christ's servants are to labor, expecting a harvest from the seed they sow. The good seed may be, for a time, lie unnoticed in a cold, selfish, worldly heart, giving no evidence that it has taken root. But afterward, this, as the Spirit of God breathes on the soul, the hidden seed springs up and at last bears fruit to the glory of God. In our life work, we know not which shall prosper, this or that. This is not a question for us to settle. We are to do our work and leave the results with God. In the morning sow thy seed, in the evening withhold not thine hand. God's great covenant declares that while the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest shall not cease. In the confidence of this promise the husbandman tills and sows. Not less confidently are we in the spiritual sowing to labor, trusting his assurance, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. The germination of the seed represents the beginning of spiritual life, and the development of the plant is a beautiful figure of Christian growth. As in nature, so in grace, there can be no life without growth. The plant must either grow or die. As its growth is silent and imperceptible, but continuous, so is the development of the Christian life. At every stage of development, our life may be perfect, yet if God's purpose for us is fulfilled, there will be continual advancement. Sanctification is the work of a lifetime. As our opportunities multiply, our experience will enlarge and our knowledge increase. We shall become strong to bear responsibility, and our maturity will be in proportion to our privileges. The plant grows by receiving that which God has provided to sustain its life. It sends down its roots into the earth. It drinks in the sunshine, the dew, and the rain. It receives the life-giving properties from the air. So the Christian is to grow by cooperating with the divine agencies. Feeling our helplessness, we are to improve all the opportunities granted us to gain a fuller experience. As the plant takes root in the soil, so we are to take deep root in Christ. As the plant receives the sunshine, the dew, the rain, we are to open our hearts to the Holy Spirit. The work is to be done not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. If we keep our minds stayed upon Christ, he will come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. As the Son of Righteousness, he will arise upon us with healing in his wings. We shall grow as the lily, we shall revive as the corn, and grow as the vine. By constantly relying upon Christ as our personal Savior, we shall grow up into him in all things who is our head. The wheat develops, first the blade, then the ear. After that, the full corn in the ear. The object of the husbandman in the sowing of the seed and the culture of the growing plant is the production of grain. He desires bread for the hungry and seed for future harvests. So the divine husbandman looks for a harvest as the reward of his labor and sacrifice. Christ is seeking to reproduce himself in the hearts of men, and he does this through those who believe in him. The object of the Christian life is fruit-bearing, the reproduction of Christ's character in the believer that it may be reproduced in others. The plant does not germinate, grow, or bring forth fruit for itself but to give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So no man is to live unto himself. The Christian is in the world as a representative of Christ for the salvation of other souls. There can be no growth or fruitlessness in the life that is centered in self. If you have accepted Christ as a personal savior, you are to forget yourself and try to help others. Talk of the love of Christ tell of his goodness, do every duty that presents itself. 
Carry the burden of souls upon your heart, and by every means in your power seek to save the lost. As you receive the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of unselfish love and labor for others, you will grow and bring forth fruit. The graces of the Spirit will ripen in your character, your faith will increase, your convictions deepen, your love be made perfect. More and more you will reflect the likeness of Christ in all that is pure, noble, and lovely. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. This fruit can never perish, but will produce after its kind a harvest unto eternal life. When the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in the sickle, because the harvest is come. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. It is the privilege of every Christian not only to look for, but to hasten the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Were all who profess his name bearing fruit to his glory, how quickly the whole world would be sown with the seed of the gospel. Quickly the last great harvest would be ripened, and Christ would come to gather the precious grain. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of Christ's Object Lessons. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Christ's Object Lessons by Ellen G. White. Chapter 4. Tears. Another parable he put forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat, and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. The field, Christ said, is the world. But we must understand this as signifying the church of Christ in the world. The parable is a description of that which pertains to the kingdom of God, his work for salvation of men, and this work is accomplished through the church. True, the Holy Spirit has gone out into all the world. Everywhere it is moving upon the hearts of men. But it is in the church that we are to grow and ripen for the garner of God. He that sowed the good seed is the son of man. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The good seed represents those who are born of the word of God, the truth. The tares represent a class who are the fruit or embodiment of error, of false principles. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. Neither God nor his angels ever sowed a seed that would produce a tare. The tares are always sown by Satan, the enemy of God and man. In the East, men sometimes took revenge upon an enemy by strewing his newly sown fields with the seeds of some noxious weed that, while growing, closely resembled wheat. Springing up with the wheat, it injured the crop and brought trouble and loss to the owner of the field. So it is from enmity to Christ that Satan scatters his evil seed among the good grain of the kingdom. The fruit of his sowing he attributes to the Son of God by bringing into the church those who bear Christ's name, while they deny his character, the wicked one causes that God shall be dishonored, the work of salvation misrepresented, and souls imperiled. Christ's servants are grieved as they see true and false believers mingled in the church. They long to do something to cleanse the church, like the servants of the householder. They are ready to uproot the tares. But Christ says to them, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. Christ has plainly taught that those who persist in open sin must be separated from the church. But he has not committed to us the work of judging character and motive. He knows our nature too well to entrust this work to us. Should we try to uproot from the church those whom we suppose to be spurious Christians, we should be sure to make mistakes. Often we regard as hopeless subjects the very ones whom Christ is drawing to himself. Were we to deal with these souls according to our imperfect judgment, it would perhaps extinguish their last hope. Many who think themselves Christians will at last be found wanting. Many will be in heaven who their neighbors supposed would never enter there. Man judges from appearance, but God judges from the heart. 
The tares and the wheat are to grow together until the harvest, and the harvest is the end of probationary time. There is in the Savior's words another lesson, a lesson of wonderful forbearance and tender love. As the tares have their roots closely intertwined with those of the good grain, so false brethren in the church may be closely linked to true disciples. The real character of these pretend believers is not fully manifested. Were they to be separated from the church, others might be caused to stumble, who but for this would have remained steadfast. The teaching of this parable is illustrated in God's own dealing with men and angels. Satan is a deceiver. When he sinned in heaven, even the loyal angels did not fully discern his character. This was why God did not at once destroy Satan. Had he done so, the holy angels would not have perceived the justice and love of God. A doubt of God's goodness would have been as evil seed that would yield the bitter fruit of sin and woe. Therefore the author of evil was spared, fully to develop his character. Through long ages God has borne the anguish of beholding the work of evil. He has given the infinite gift of Calvary, rather than leave any to be deceived by the misrepresentations of the wicked one. For the tares could not be plucked up without danger of uprooting the precious grain. And shall we not be as forbearing toward our fellow men as the Lord of heaven and earth is toward Satan? The world has no right to doubt the truth of Christianity, because there are unworthy members in the church, nor should Christians become disheartened because of these false brethren. How was it with the early church? Ananias and Sapphira joined themselves to the disciples. Simon Magus was baptized. Demas, who forsook Paul, had been counted a believer. Judas Iscariot was numbered with the apostles. The Redeemer does not want to lose one soul. His experience with Judas is recorded to show his long patience with perverse human nature, and he bids us bear with it as he has borne. He has said that false brethren will be found in the church till the close of time. Notwithstanding Christ's warning, men have sought to uproot the tares, to punish those who were supposed to be evildoers. The church has had recourse to the civil power. Those who deferred from the established doctrines have been imprisoned, put to torture and to death at the instigation of men who claim to be acting under the sanction of Christ. But it is the spirit of Satan, not the spirit of Christ, that inspires such acts. This is Satan's own method of bringing the world under his dominion. God has been misrepresented through the church by this way of dealing with those supposed to be heretics. Not judgment and condemnation of others, but humility and distrust of self is the teaching of Christ's parable. Not all that is sown in the field is good grain. The fact that men are in the church does not prove them Christians. The tares closely resembled the wheat while the blades were green, but when the field was white for the harvest, the worthless weeds bore no likeness to the wheat that bowed under the weight of its full ripe heads. Sinners who make a pretension of piety mingle for a time with the true followers of Christ, and the semblance of Christianity is calculated to deceive many. But in the harvest of the world there will be no likeness between good and evil. Then those who have joined the church, but who have not joined Christ, will be manifest. The tares are permitted to grow among the wheat, to have all the advantages of sun and shower. But in the time of harvest ye shall return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. Christ himself will decide who are worthy to dwell with the family in heaven. He will judge every man according to his words and his works. Profession is as nothing in the scale. It is character that decides destiny. The Savior does not point forward to a time when all the tares become wheat. The wheat and tares grow together until the harvest, the end of the world. Then the tares are bound in bundles to be burned, and the wheat is gathered in the garner of God. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Then the Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. End of chapter 4「Chapter 5 of Christ's Object Lessons This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Christ's Object Lessons by Ellen G. White Chapter 5 Like a Grain of Mustard Seed In the multitude that listened to Christ's teaching there were many Pharisees. These noted contemptuously how few of his hearers acknowledged him as the Messiah, and they questioned with themselves how this unpretending teacher could exalt Israel to universal dominion. Without riches, power, or honor, how was he to establish the new kingdom? Christ read their thoughts and answered them, Whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God, or with what comparison shall we compare it? In earthly governments there was nothing that could serve for a similitude. No civil society could afford him a symbol. It is like a grain of mustard seed, he said, which, when it is sown upon the earth, though it be less than all the seeds that are upon the earth, yet when it is grown, groweth up, and becometh greater than all the herbs, and putteth out great branches, so that the birds of the heaven can lodge under the shadow thereof. The germ in the seed grows by the unfolding of the life principle which God has implanted. Its development depends upon no human power. So it is with the kingdom of Christ. It is a new creation. Its principles of development are the opposite of those that rule the kingdom of this world. Earthly governments prevail by physical force. They maintain their dominion by war. But the founder of the new kingdom is the Prince of Peace. The Holy Spirit represents worldly kingdoms under the symbol of fierce beasts of prey. But Christ is the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. In his plan of government there is no employment of brute force to compel the conscience. The Jews looked for the kingdom of God to be established in the same way as the kingdoms of the world. To promote righteousness they resorted to external measures. They devised methods and plans. But Christ implants a principle. By implanting truth and righteousness, he counterworks error and sin. As Jesus spoke this parable, the mustard plant could be seen far and near, lifting itself above the grass and grain and waving its branches lightly in the air. Birds flitted from twig to twig and sang amid the leafy foliage. Yet the seed from which sprang this giant plant was among the least of all seeds. At first it sent up a tender shoot, but it was of strong vitality, and grew and flourished until it reached its present great size. So the kingdom of Christ in its beginning seemed humble and insignificant. Compared with earthly kingdoms, it appeared to be the least of all. By the rulers of this world, Christ's claim to be king was ridiculed. Yet in the mighty truths committed to his followers, the kingdom of the gospel possessed a divine life. And how rapid was its growth! How widespread its influence! When Christ spoke this parable, there were only a few Galilean peasants to represent the new kingdom. Their poverty, the fewness of their numbers, was urged over and over again as a reason why men should not connect themselves with these simple-minded fishermen who followed Jesus. But the mustard seed was to grow and spread forth its branches throughout the world. When the earthly kingdoms whose glory then filled the hearts of men should perish, the kingdom of Christ would remain, a mighty and far-reaching power. So the work of grace in the heart is small in its beginning. A word is spoken, a ray of light is shed into the soul, an influence is exerted that is the beginning of the new life. And who can measure its results? Not only is the growth of Christ's kingdom illustrated by the parable of the mustard seed, but in every stage of its growth the experience represented in the parable is repeated. For his church in every generation, God has a special truth and a special work. The truth that is hid from the worldly wise and prudent is revealed to the childlike and humble. It calls for self-sacrifice. It has battles to fight and victories to win. At the outset its advocates are few. By the great men of the world and by the world-conforming church they are opposed and despised. See John the Baptist, the forerunner of Christ, standing alone to rebuke the pride and formalism of the Jewish nation. See the first bearers of the gospel into Europe. How obscure, how hopeless seemed the mission of Paul and Silas, the two tent-makers, as they with their companions took ship at Traos for Philippi. See Paul the aged, in chains, preaching Christ in the stronghold of the Caesars. See the little communities of slaves and peasants in conflict with the heathenism of imperial Rome. See Martin Luther withstanding that mighty church, which is the masterpiece of the world's wisdom. See him holding fast God's word against emperor and pope, declaring, Here I take my stand. 
I cannot do otherwise. God be my help. See John Wesley preaching Christ and his righteousness in the midst of formalism, sensualism, and infidelity. See one burdened with the woes of the heathen world, pleading for the privilege of carrying to them Christ's message of love. Hear the response of ecclesiasticism. Sit down, young man. When God wants to convert the heathen, he will do it without your help or mine. The great leaders of religious thought in this generation sound the praises and build the monuments of those who planted the seed of truth centuries ago. Do not many turn from this work to trample down the growth springing from the same seed today? The old cry is repeated. We know that God spake unto Moses. As for this fellow, Christ in the messenger he sends, we know not from whence he is. As in earlier ages, the special truths for this time are found not with the ecclesiastical authorities, but with men and women who are not too learned or too wise to believe the word of God. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and base things of the world, and things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And in this last generation the parable of the mustard seed is to reach a signal and triumphant fulfillment. The little seed will become a tree. The last message of warning and mercy is to go to every nation and kindred and tongue, to take out of them a people for his name, and the earth shall be lightened with his glory. End of chapter 5Chapter 6 of Christ's Object Lessons. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Christ's Object Lessons by Ellen G. White. Chapter 6 Other Lessons from Seed Sowing. From the work of seed sowing and the growth of the plant from the seed, precious lessons may be taught in the family and in the school. Let the children and youth learn to recognize in natural things the working of divine agencies, and they will be enabled to grasp by faith unseen benefits. As they come to understand the wonderful work of God in supplying the wants of His great family, and how we are to cooperate with Him, they will have more faith in God, and will realize more of His power in their own daily life. God created the seed, as He created the earth, by His word. By his word he gave it power to grow and to multiply. He said, Let the earth bring forth grass, and the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And God saw that it was good. It is that word which still causes the seeds to grow. Every seed that sends up its green blade to the sunlight declares the wonder-working power of that word uttered by him who spake and it was, who commanded and it stood fast. Christ taught his disciples to pray, Give us this day our daily bread. And pointing to the flowers, he gave them the assurance, If God so clothes the grass of the field, shall he not much more clothe you? Christ is constantly working to answer this prayer, and to make good his assurance. There is an invisible power constantly at work as man's servant to feed and to clothe him. Many agencies our Lord employs to make the seed apparently thrown away a living plant, and he supplies in due proportion all that is required to perfect the harvest. In the beautiful words of the psalmist, Thou visitest the earth and waterest it, thou greatly enrichest it. The river of God is full of water. Thou providest them corn when thou hast so prepared the earth. Thou waterest her furrows abundantly. Thou settlest the ridges thereof. Thou makest it soft with showers. Thou blessest the springing thereof. Thou crownest the year with thy goodness, and thy paths drop fatness. The material world is under God's control. The laws of nature are obeyed by nature. Everything speaks and acts the will of the Creator. Cloud and sunshine, dew and rain, wind and storm, all are under the supervision of God, and yield implicit obedience to His command. It is in obedience to the law of God that the spire of grain bursts through the ground, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. 
These the Lord develops in their proper season, because they do not resist His working. And can it be that man, made in the image of God, endowed with reason and speech, shall alone be unappreciative of His gifts and disobedient to His will? Shall rational beings alone cause confusion in our world? In everything that tends to the sustenance of man is seen the concurrence of divine and human effort. There can be no reaping unless the human hand acts its part in the sowing of the seed. But without the agencies which God provides in giving sunshine and showers, dew and clouds, there would be no increase. Thus it is in every business pursuit, in every department of study and science. Thus it is in spiritual things, in the formation of character, and in every line of Christian work. We have a part to act. But we must have the power of divinity to unite with us, or our efforts will be in vain. Whenever man accomplishes anything, whether in spiritual or in temporal lines, he should bear in mind that he does it through cooperation with his Maker. There is great necessity for us to realize our dependence on God. Too much confidence is placed in man, too much reliance on human inventions. There is too little confidence in the power which God stands ready to give. We are laborers together with God. Immeasurably inferior is the part which the human agent sustains. But if he is linked with the divinity of Christ, he can do all things through the strength that Christ imparts. The gradual development of the plant from the seed is an object lesson in child training. There is first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. He who gave this parable created the tiny seed, gave it its vital properties, and ordained the laws that govern its growth. And the truths which the parable teaches were made a living reality in his own life. In both his physical and his spiritual nature, he followed the divine order of growth illustrated by the plant, as he wishes all youth to do. Although he was the majesty of heaven, the king of glory, he became a babe in Bethlehem, and for a time represented the helpless infant in its mother's care. In childhood he did the works of an obedient child. He spoke and acted with the wisdom of a child and not of a man, honoring his parents and carrying out their wishes in helpful ways, according to the ability of a child. But at each stage of his development he was perfect, with the simple, natural grace of a sinless life. The sacred record says of his childhood, The child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And of his youth it is recorded, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, and in favor with God and with man. The work of parents and teachers is here suggested. They should aim so to cultivate the tendencies of the youth that at each stage of their life they may represent the natural beauty appropriate to that period, unfolding naturally as do plants in the garden. Those children are most attractive who are natural unaffected. It is not wise to give them special notice and repeat their clever sayings before them. Vanity should not be encouraged by praising their looks, their words, or their actions, nor should they be dressed in an expensive or showy manner. This encourages pride in them and awakens envy in the hearts of their companions. The little ones should be educated in childlike simplicity. They should be trained to be content with the small, helpful duties and the pleasures and experiences natural to their years. Childhood answers to the blade in the parable, and the blade has a beauty peculiarly of its own. The children should not be forced into precocious maturity, but should retain as long as possible the freshness and grace of their early years. The little children may be Christians, having an experience in accordance with their years. This is all that God expects of them. They need to be educated in spiritual things, and parents should give them every advantage that they may form characters after the similitude of the character of Christ. In the laws of God in nature, effect follows cause with unerring certainty. The reaping will testify as to what the sowing has been. The slothful worker is condemned by his work. The harvest bears witness against him. So in spiritual things, the faithfulness of every worker is measured by the results of his work. The character of his work, whether diligent or slothful, is revealed by the harvest. It is thus that his destiny for eternity is decided. Every seed sown produces a harvest of its kind. So it is in the human life. We all need to sow the seeds of compassion, sympathy, and love. For we shall reap what we sow.
Every characteristic of selfishness, self-love, self-esteem, every act of self-indulgence will bring forth a like harvest. He who lives for self is sowing to the flesh, and of the flesh he will reap corruption. God destroys no man. Everyone who is destroyed will have destroyed himself. Everyone who stifles the admonitions of conscience is sowing the seeds of unbelief, and these will produce a sure harvest. By rejecting the first warning from God, Pharaoh of old sowed the seeds of obstinacy, and he reaped obstinacy. God did not compel him to disbelieve. The seed of unbelief which he sowed produced a harvest of its kind. Thus his resistance continued, until he looked upon his devastated land, upon the cold, dead form of his firstborn, and the firstborn of all in his house, and of all the families in his kingdom, until the waters of the sea closed over his horses and his chariots and his men of war. His history is a fearful illustration of the truth of the words that whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Did men but realize this, they would be careful what seed they sow. As the seed sown produces a harvest, and this in turn is sown, the harvest is multiplied. In our relation to others, this law holds true. Every act, every word is a seed that will bear fruit. Every deed of thoughtful kindness, of obedience, or of self-denial will reproduce itself in others, and through them in still others. So every act of envy, malice, or dissension is a seed that will spring up in a root of bitterness, whereby many shall be defiled. And how much larger number will the many poison? Thus the sowing of good and evil goes on for time and for eternity." Liberality, both in spiritual and in temporal things, is taught in the lesson of seed-sowing. The Lord says, Blessed are ye that sow beside all waters. This I say, He which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. To sow beside all waters means a continual imparting of God's gifts. It means giving wherever the cause of God or the needs of humanity demand our aid. This will not tend to poverty. He which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. The sower multiplies his seed by casting it away. So it is with those who are faithful in distributing God's gifts. By imparting, they increase their blessings. God has promised them a sufficiency that they may continue to give. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom." And more than this is wrapped up in the sowing and reaping. As we distribute God's temporal blessings, the evidence of our love and sympathy awakens in the receiver gratitude and thanksgiving to God. The soil of the heart is prepared to receive the seeds of spiritual truth, and he who ministers seed to the sower will cause the seed to germinate and bear fruit unto eternal life. By the casting of the grain into the soil, Christ represents the sacrifice of himself for our redemption. Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, he says, it abideth alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. So the death of Christ will result in fruit for the kingdom of God. In accordance with the law of the vegetable, kingdom life will be the result of his death. And all who would bring forth fruit as workers together with Christ must first fall into the ground and die. The life must be cast into the furrow of the world's need. Self-love, self-interest must perish. But the law of self-sacrifice is the law of self-preservation. The seed buried in the ground produces fruit, and in turn this is planted. Thus the harvest is multiplied. The husbandman preserves his grain by casting it away. So in human life, to give is to live. The life that will be preserved is the life that is freely given in service to God and man. Those who for Christ's sake sacrifice their life in this world will keep it unto life eternal. The seed dies to spring forth into new life, and in this we are taught the lesson of resurrection. All who love God will live again in the Eden above. Of the human body laid away to molder in the grave, God has said, It is sown into corruption, and it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, and raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, and it is raised in power. Such are a few of the many lessons taught by nature's living parable of the sower and the seed. As parents and teachers try to teach these lessons, the work should be made practical. Let the children themselves prepare the soil and sow the seed. 
As they work, the parent or teacher can explain the garden of the heart with the good or bad seed sown there, and that, as the garden must be prepared for the natural seed, so the heart must be prepared for the seed of truth. As the seed is cast into the ground, they can teach the lesson of Christ's death, and as the blade springs up the truth of the resurrection. As the plants grow, the correspondence between the natural and the spiritual sowing may be continued. The youth should be instructed in a similar way. They should be taught to till the soil. It would be well if there were connected with every school lands for cultivation. Such lands should be regarded as God's own schoolroom. The things of nature should be looked upon as a lesson book which his children are to study, and from which they may obtain knowledge as to the culture of the soul. In tilling the soil, in disciplining and in subduing the land, lessons may constantly be learned. Not one would think of settling upon a raw piece of land, expecting it to at once yield a harvest. Earnestness, diligence, and persevering labor are to be put forth in treating the soil preparatory to sowing the seed. So it is in the spiritual work in the human heart. Those who would be benefited by the tilling of the soil must go forth with the word of God in their hearts. They will then find the fallow ground of the heart broken by the softening, subduing influence of the Holy Spirit. Unless hard work is bestowed on the soil, it will not yield a harvest. So with the soil of the heart, the Spirit of God must work upon it to refine and discipline it before it can bring forth fruit to the glory of God. The soil will not produce its riches when worked by impulse. It needs thoughtful daily attention. It must be plowed often and deep, with a view to keeping out the weeds that take nourishment from the good seed planted. Thus those who plow and sow prepare for the harvest. None need stand in the field amid the sad wreck of their hopes. The blessing of the Lord will rest upon those who thus work the land, learning spiritual lessons from nature. In cultivating the soil, the worker knows little what treasures will open up before him. When he is not to despise the instruction, he may gather from minds that have had an experience, and from the information that intelligent men may impart, he should gather lessons for himself. This is part of his training. The cultivation of the soil will prove an education to the soul. He who causes the seed to spring up, who tends it day and night, who gives it power to develop, is the author of our being, the King of heaven, and he exercises still greater care and interest in behalf of his children. While the human sower is planting the seed to sustain our earthly life, the divine sower will plant in the soul seed that will bring forth fruit unto life everlasting. End of chapter 6《Chapter 7 of Christ's Object Lessons》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Christ's Object Lessons》by Ellen G. White Chapter 7 — Like Unto Leaven Many educated and influential men had come to hear the prophet of Galilee. Some of these looked with curious interest upon the multitude that had gathered about Christ as he taught by the sea. In this great throng all classes of society were represented. There were the poor, the illiterate, the ragged beggar, the robber with the seal of guilt upon his face, the maim, the dissipated, the merchant, and the man of leisure, high and low, rich and poor, all crowding upon one another for a place to stand and hear the words of Christ. As these cultured men gazed upon the strange assembly, they asked themselves, is the kingdom of God composed of such material as this? Again the Saviour replied by parable, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, till the whole was leavened. Among the Jews leaven was sometimes used as an emblem of sin. At the time of the Passover the people were directed to remove all the leaven from their houses, as they were to put away sin from their hearts. Christ warned his disciples, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. And the Apostle Paul speaks of the leaven of malice and wickedness. But in the Savior's parable, leaven is used to represent the kingdom of heaven. It illustrates the quickening, assimilating power of grace of God. None are so vile, none have fallen so low as to be beyond the working of his power. In all who will submit themselves to the Holy Spirit, a new principle of life is to be implanted. The lost image of God is to be restored in humanity. 
But man cannot transform himself by the exercise of his will. He possesses no power by which this change can be effected. The leaven, something holy from without, must be put into the meal before the desired change can be wrought in it. So the grace of God must be received by the sinner before he can be fitted for the kingdom of glory. All the culture and education which the world can give will fail of making a degraded child of sin a child of heaven. The renewing energy must come from God. The change can be made only by the Holy Spirit. All who would be saved, high or low, rich or poor, must submit to the working of this power. As the leaven, when mingled with the meal, works from within, outward, so it is by the renewing of the heart that the grace of God works to transform the life. No mere external change is sufficient to bring us into harmony with God. There are many who try to reform by correcting this or that bad habit, and they hope in this way to become Christians. But they are beginning in the wrong place. Our first work is with the heart. A profession of faith and the possession of truth in the soul are two different things. The mere knowledge of truth is not enough. We may possess this, but the tenor of our thoughts may not be changed. The heart must be converted and sanctified. The man who attempts to keep the commandments of God from a sense of obligation merely, because he is required to do so, will never enter into the joy of obedience. He does not obey. When the requirements of God are accounted a burden because they cut across human inclination, we may know that the life is not a Christian life. True obedience is the outworking of a principle within. It springs from the love of righteousness, the love of the law of God. The essence of all righteousness is loyalty to our Redeemer. This will lead us to do right because it is right, because right doing is pleasing to God. The great truth of the conversion of the heart by the Holy Spirit is present in Christ's words to Nicodemus. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit." The Apostle Paul, writing by the Spirit, says, God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace ye are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. The leaven hidden in the flour works invisibly to bring the whole mass under its leavening process. So the leaven of truth works secretly, silently, steadily to transform the soul. The natural inclinations are softened and subdued. New thoughts, new feelings, new motives are implanted. A new standard of character is set up. The life of Christ. The mind is changed. The faculties are roused to action in new lines. Man is not endowed with new faculties, but the faculties he has are sanctified. The conscience is awakened. We are endowed with traits of character that enable us to do service for God. Often the question arises, Why then are there so many claiming to believe God's word in whom there is not seen a reformation in words, in spirit, and in character? Why are there so many who cannot bear opposition to their purposes and plans, who manifest an unholy temper, and whose words are harsh, overbearing, and passionate? There is seen in their lives the same love of self, the same selfish indulgence, the same temper and hasty speech that is seen in the life of the worldling. There is the same sensitive pride, the same yielding to natural inclination, the same perversity of character, as if the truth were wholly unknown to them. The reason is that they are not converted. They have not hidden the leaven of truth in their heart. It has not had opportunity to do its work. Their natural and cultivated tendencies to evil have not been submitted to it this transforming power. Their lives reveal the absence of the grace of Christ, an unbelief in his power to transform the character. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The scriptures are the great agency in the transformation of character. Christ prayed, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. If studied and obeyed, the word of God works in the heart, subduing every unholy attribute. 
The Holy Spirit comes to convict of sin, and the faith that springs up in the heart works by love to Christ, conforming us in body, soul, and spirit to His own image. Then God can use us to do His will. The power given us works from within, outwardly, leading us to communicate to others the truth that has been communicated to us. The truths of the Word of God meet man's great practical necessity, the conversion of the soul through faith. These grand principles are not to be thought too pure and holy to be brought into the daily life. They are truths which reach to heaven and compass eternity, yet their vital influence is to be woven into human experience. They are to permeate all the great things and all the little things of life. Received into the heart, the leaven of truth will regulate the desires, purify the thoughts, and sweeten the disposition. It quickens the faculties of the mind and the energies of the soul. It enlarges the capacity for feeling and for loving. The world regards as a mystery the man who is imbued with this principle. The selfish, money-loving man lives only to secure for himself the riches, honors, and pleasures of this world. He loses the eternal world from his reckoning. But with the follower of Christ these things will not be all-absorbing. For Christ's sake he will labor and deny self, that he may aid in the great work of saving souls who are without Christ and without hope in the world. Such a man the world cannot understand, for he is keeping in view eternal realities. The love of Christ with its redeeming power has come into the heart. This love masters every other motive and raises its possessor above the corrupting influence of the world. The word of God is to have a sanctifying effect on our association with every member of the human family. The leaven of truth will not produce the spirit of rivalry, the love of ambition, the desire to be first, True, heaven-born love is not selfish and changeable. It is not dependent on human praise. The heart of him who receives the grace of God overflows with love for God and for those for whom Christ died. Self is not struggling for recognition. He does not love others because they love and please him, because they appreciate his merits, but because they are Christ's purchased possession. If his motives, words, or actions are misunderstood or misrepresented, he takes no offense, but pursues the even tenor of his way. He is kind and thoughtful, humble in his opinion of himself, yet full of hope, always trusting in the mercy and love of God. The apostle exhorts us, As he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. The grace of Christ is to control the temper and the voice. Its working will be seen in politeness and tender regard shown by brother for brother, in kind, encouraging words. An angel presence is in the home. The life breathes a sweet perfume which ascends to God as holy incense. Love is manifested in kindness, gentleness, forbearance, and long-suffering. The countenance is changed. Christ abiding in the heart shines out in the faces of those who love him and keep his commandments. Truth is written there. The sweet peace of heaven is revealed. There is expressed an habitual gentleness, a more than human love. The leaven of truth works a change in the whole man, making the coarse refined, the rough gentle, and the selfish generous. By it the impure are cleansed, washed in the blood of the Lamb. Through its life-giving power it brings all there is of mind and soul and strength into harmony with the divine life. Man with his human nature becomes a partaker of divinity. Christ is honored in excellence and perfection of character. As these changes are effected, angels break forth into rapturous song, and God and Christ rejoice over souls fashioned after the divine similitude. End of chapter 7